Okay, so hello guys. My name is Marcos Paulo de Souza. I work for Souza and I'm here with Joe Lawrence, who works for Head Head. And this time we'll be talking about kernel life patching hands on. Okay, so the agenda for today is about to talk about approaches of creating life patches. Um, some concerns uh, for these two approaches that we're going to discuss. The tools themselves, they are open source, so show them, show where you can find and install them. And also show how you can use these tools to create your own live patches. And the expectations for you guys is uh, when the presentation is finished, you'll be able to create your own live patches. You know how to interact with the, the, the tools and also check the changes that you created with the live patches. Um, so this is the second part of uh, the two sessions that we, that were planned. The first one um, was about the so kernel life patching subsystem, <clears throat> introducing this the subsystem historical uh, effects about how it got merged the kernel, and so it will be. Uh, um, yeah, to have great value if you can watch that too, because this is the second part of that same session. So here are the links for the slides and the recording. Um, so starting uh, this presentation about uh, the creating process of live patches. Uh, creating live patches is a laborious process if done manually in very, in very error prone. So you need to consider a lot of, of details when creating a live patch. First off, you need to take a look into the visibility of the symbols that will be patched. Some of them could be inline, private, duplicate. And if the symbol in question uh, falls into these categories, you need to do some workarounds. Uh, if you're dealing with macros as well, macros can expand to different um, representations of one would expect and also need to be you, you need to pay attention to that uh, we create when creating a live patch uh, uh, the patch function may also need to access structs and, and and other types that are that are not public so depending on the approach that you use you need to take care of that too and also there are situations where the file in question or the functions that you're trying to patch are not live patchable, meaning that the tracing for that specific files or functions is turned off. And as the live patch subsystem uses ftrace, if it's not traceable, it's not patchable. And one very important aspect of creating live patches is to take a look, is to noticing that not every upstream patch that resolves a vulnerability uh, is ready to become a live patch. And this is very important because it's not something that you just fit in a patch and you produce a kernel object and you apply it and that's, and that's it. Uh, so you need to take care about that. So if the patch itself changes some strict layouts, or uh, uh, or do some assignments to read all the sections on the final binary that's not going to work as well. This will be discussed later. Um, now, okay, just think about every talk that I just said and thinking about doing that, those checks manually for tens of kernel versions. Uh, this, is the re this is the reality for live patch vendors uh, since most of them uh, support various uh, kernels with different lifetimes. And just for example, at SUSE, we maintain uh, more than 60 kernel versions and all of them with different uh, patches applied, resulting in very different kernels compiled by very different toolchain versions. So this can become a nightmare if you do this, this work manually. So here is where the tools come in, in handy. So there are tools to, that easy this, this burden of the manual checks. And currently there are two approaches, uh, at least open source approaches to create live patches, which is the source-based approach and the binary-based approach. Uh, both of them have pros and, and cons and that varies with what you are trying to achieve. 
uh, but they are being used for quite some time. So they are uh, uh, very well uh, uh, tested in the field. So I will start about source-based live patch creation. This is what we use in, in at SUSE to create live patches. So this the steps involve extracting the defective code, the defective code and applying patches, or applying patches and extracting the, the code. Uh, as the name implies, we extract the defective code, apply the patches, and generate a kernel module of it, uh, out of tree module. That's basically what it does. Uh, so what you see in the source file uh, is the same function that we compiled. That's it. Uh, depending on the patch that you are that you are using to create the live patch, you can just apply the patch before extracting the code. So the code will be extracted, fixed. And depending case by case, this turns out to be more difficult. So we first we extract the code and later we adapt the, the changes. Uh, because it's source based, sometimes uh, uh, we need to take care of another details that is exclusive to source based approach. Some functions that are used by the to be patched symbol, they are inlined or, or optimized. So we need to copy over these functions as well. Right? Uh, types and macros, uh, the same issue because you are extracting a function right, that will be compiled as a standalone module. And it won't compile if it doesn't know the, the the definition of some types, structs, and so on. So you need to bring that on too. Um, symbols again. So uh, if you you are accessing private symbols when you are compiling the kernel, you might end up uh, having issues because the symbol is not is not there. So in other kernels, we used chaos sims to fit in the address of of the symbols of the currently running kernel. But nowadays we use KOP convert, which is a tool that it's still not merged in the upstream kernel, but, but it's being discussed on the mailing list. And also uh, live patch vendors usually support more than one architecture. And for the source-based approach, we can, we can extract the code once and then use it uh, to compile to other architectures. But from time to time, it can uh, cause problems. So you need to take a look if you are handling very low level primitives. And maybe sometimes you need to adapt to the, the same code to multiple architectures. That's not the, the common case. But from time to time, you need to take care of some things like, like this. Um, so for the source-based approach, uh, currently we, we use KOP build and KOP CCP as the two tools to, to help us to extract the code and to do those checks. Uh, KOP CCP is around for more than five years, if I'm not mistaken. But currently we are, all, we are working on the Clang extract, which is a tool that relies on LLVM machinery. Uh, KOP build is the tool that does all those checkings that I mentioned before. So this is a, a setup step, let's say that, to make sure that we support uh, the same left patch in all possible kernels. Uh, so, so specifically for the tools, KOP build was created to check multiple differences between all the supported uh, kernels that we have at SUSE when creating live patch because they may differ in config uh, being set, modules being enabled or not. And just to avoid issues before extracting the code, we just check every affected kernel. And even for, a, in even for our use, we can detect which of those kernels are vulnerable to a CV or not. And also KP build uses Clang ex ex extract uh, in the second phase to extract the, the changes. Uh, Clang Extract was initially created to, to create e user space live patching by the SUSE's tool, tool chain team. And we later adapted it to handle kernel source code. Um, it was necessary to adapt because decisions about symbols and lining and 
code that was inline. It is different for user space. And so we need to feed in some more information in order to Clang Extract to make the correct assumptions. Uh, Clang Extract consumes the same arguments that GCC used to compile the code originally. So yeah, so it's basically a new, new compiler to extract the code. Um, okay, so these are the, the tools that we use currently, KP Build plus Clang X Extract and more details about uh, what they do, right? Of course, it's much more complicated than this, but this, this summarizes uh, uh, on a high level what the tools do. Also, after KP Build calls Clang Extract, uh, Clang Extract uh, uh, outputs the source code and all the dependencies of that. And then KP Build creates a template to hook into the live patch API entry points. And yeah, that's basically how it works. So for the setup, you need to install KP Build. So it's, it's a Python tool, so it's not uh, complicated. Um, you can also run it uh, on a cloned directory if you have the dependencies installed. Clang Extract is a C++ project. It, it depends, as the name implies, on the LLVM and other uh, minor dependencies like Amazon and Ninja, but these are being used everywhere nowadays. And also you need a kernel source tree compiled with two uh, patches, uh, one patch set and one patch. The KOP convert patch set, uh, it's not merged yet, so you need to apply that. And the IP clones, we just add some more um, compiler arguments for GCC to, to output the IPA clones, which is the inter-process analysis, uh, which uh, contain information about functions that were inlined into other functions. So this is very important for Plank Extract to do the right thing uh, when implying if functions are being called uh, or if they are inlined. <clears throat> So uh, at SUSE, we, uh, we don't require a, a, a kernel source per se. We can just download the RPMs and such, but we are trying to adapt KOP building like ex extracts to work on the currently running system. It's, it's, it's still uh, in, the, in, in the works, but that works differently for, for sleep kernels. Um, so we use the VM Linux generated and the modules to, to, to check if the symbols are there, IP clones to check for inline functions, and also the module symverse file, that is the result of the compilation of the, of the kernel, to check with which symbols we need to externalize or relocate. Okay, so now showing KOP build, uh, this is the base configuration that is created the first time that you run the tool. Uh, here it just points to my local paths. Uh, work there uh, means that this is the place where the, the outcome of the KOP building extract will, will, be, will, will be placed. It, and the data there is the place where the, the kernel source, the compiled kernel source is. So, uh, this is the setup phase. We just put the name of the live patch that we are going to, to, to create just to differentiate between others. And here we add the config uh, uh, and the kernel config necessary for that specific functionality to be uh, that was used to compile the, the code. We added this uh, back then when supported multiple kernels at SUSE because between different kernels, sometimes we have config mismatches, some things that were enabled and disabled. And also we deal with different architectures, so configs also differ between them. Um, and also we have this file funks argument, which, which we just pass one path for a file and multiple functions. And this, is, and this will, will be used by Clang Extract to extract all the functions for a file. So the name is very is, is straightforward. So if this works correctly, we can then go to the next phase, which, which is the extract phase, where we just pass the name of the live patch that we used in the previous step. And this apply patches is, is an optional argument. So if we pass this, 
Uh, we will apply patches for the fixes deer that is in the data deer uh, path that we passed for in that config file. And this is just uh, mostly the same example from the kernel samples directory. Because uh, this just shows the the, the most uh, simple life patch that you can create, which is just patching the command line proc show function. So by executing this capability extract uh, subcommand, uh, sub we will just uh, apply this patch and extract the code before uh, applying the patch before ex 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 extracting the code. So when extract finishes, this will be the output from Clang extract. Uh, and also, this also contains the, the template that KP build added. So just first includes and stuff. And here we can say that this is the, the same file. Uh, we have the command line proc show function with a prefix. We, we add this to differentiate between the symbols loaded in the kernel. So it's easy for us to know when a live patch symbol was reached or, or not, right? And we can see that the, the code changed, right? So the patch was applied. And down there we have those huge macros. Uh, so these macros, they exist because of KOP convert tool, which creates relocation entries for private symbols. So without this, without this this feature, uh, it's it's difficult to access private symbols. So the the get of it is is that extern shard saved command line variable, which uh, will be will be referenced by will be relocated to the currently address of the saved command line on the running kernel. So that's why we have these strange macros. It will be removed uh, as soon as the kernel, uh, as the KOP convert uh, patch set is, is merged, I think. But this is so speed by Clang Extract. By Clang ex extract. Yeah. Um, two questions in the uh, Q&A. Um, the first one is, I don't know if you can see it, but I can read it to you. Can these extract and tool, extraction tools handle function pointers? That is the first question. Yes, yes, it, it would just check for the symbols and yeah, if they are referenced, it would just copy the code over and adjust. If there are functional pointers, it would just reference the, the pointer. Yeah, that works. Okay. There is a second question. After SUSE kernel live patching system requires the reboot or not? I think you have covered extensively in the previous one, but I will let you handle the question. Mm -hmm. So the whole point of live patching is not rebooting the system. So because if you reboot the system, you can safely boot into a new uh, kernel with the security fixes applied. So yeah, that's the whole point to not reboot the system. Thank you. Yeah. No other questions yeah. at this time. Okay, yeah. So yeah, so this is the, the file that was uh, ex extracted. And now we have the, the common template code that just hooks this new function into the live patch API. And yeah, that's that's common to all live patches, right? Have these hooks. So, okay. So we can just enter in the directories uh, created by KOP build run make, and we will have this new KO file being generated, which is our live patch compiled, right? Uh, so as we shown in the previous session for loading uh, this live patch, it's just running ismod. Here, I'm just showing an example using virtme. So the command line uh, files spits out a very long line. So I just trimmed it just to show that if we apply the, the live patch module, it adds that patch it equals one. And once we disable that, it just, yeah, it just returns to the original state. So it's the same example basically from the samples directory in the kernel for the live patching, but here's showing that this is done automatically instead of writing this, this code manually. So if you think about a more complex patch, imagine that we would have maybe tens of this uh, KOP relox symbol entries 
for each private symbol that we might find, that we may find. So creating this manually can lead you to serious problems. So this is just a, a small example, but day-to-day -day patches, they're much more complicated than they, they have much more challenges. Um, so what's important is that QP Build is still a young tool. I mean, we used this internally until some months ago uh, that we open sourced it. Uh, expect some of these commands to change their 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 names and their uh, and the arguments as we are adapting this to be used on the currently system being running. We are changing this a lot, and the same applies to Clang Extract. Although Clang Extract um, is just fixes for handling the C code and not much the arguments, so it's much more stable API wise. But also, yeah, please check on the latest versions on GitHub. And that's it for the source-based approach. All right. Hi, I'm Joe Lawrence. I'm from Red Hat. And uh, I guess I wanted to present a sort of contrasting um, solution for generating live patches, which um, commonly call um, Binary based, um, and so project that we use it's um, what's called K Patch. Um, it's uh, available on GitHub, and it's been started I think about ten years ago. Um, it supports um, a number of distributions um, and architectures, and of course we're always welcome to uh, to entertain patches to to um, add your own distribution or consider um, architectures. And um, I guess the, the interesting difference um, behind the tool is that unlike the source-based approach, which sort of tries to extract the, the source code change and then figure out how to build a patch from there, um, a patch uh, build does the opposite. Um, it waits until the sort of end of the process. It, it builds a patched kernel and then works backwards to, to figure out, well, what are the binary changes that occurred um, because of this, because of the source code change? And then how can I add uh, a similar live patch API uh, boilerplate to, uh, to connect it up with the kernel? Um, so first, uh, I just want to introduce that this utility. This comes along with the um, the GitHub uh, project, um, and some distributions may may package this. Uh, there's a kpatch utility. It's just a very small wrapper script around installing live patch kernel modules um, and uh, potentially building them, loading them, listing them, all the sort of user maintenance type things. Uh, and we'll come back to this in my example. We'll, we'll use this utility to, to load a generative live patch. Okay. Um, so an important concept uh, for kpatch, and I think this came directly from um, uh, the original KSplice project, um, is that in, in order to more easily sort of digest and um, figure out what binary changes have occurred as a result of a live patch. Um, the kpatch build will create um, kernel builds using um, some special options. Um, one of them is dash f function sections. And the net effect of that is it will take um, the functions as you might see them in a, a source file and give them their own dedicated ELF section in the resulting output file. So I tried to depict it here. Um, you, If you had three functions, A, B, and C in your source file, if the compiler you know, created the object code where all three of them were, were real functions, then the resulting file, you would see a um, specific section for each one. Um, and so for kpatch build, this is interesting for us because if there are no changes to function A uh, or B, then those resulting sections will, will basically be identical. Um, however, if there was a change in function C, 
uh, and it was restricted only to that function, then uh, we might see only a little change in that one section in the resulting object file. So this process uh, is yeah, easy as, uh, as one, two, three. Um, this is basically kind of a similar idea of, of uh, what I was trying to describe. If you had a few functions, um, the ones that remain the same kind of don't care about, um, but for any functions that have been added um, or any fun function sections for which have changed, uh, we have sort of um, take that delta and then add it to the boilerplate um, uh, live patching registration uh, in the resulting uh, kernel object. Um, that's as, as brief as I can explain kpatch build, but get into some more details on the next slides. Okay, so setting it up. Um, so the setup, uh, I'd probably recommend if, if your intention is to uh, load them, is to set up a virtual machine, or uh, if, you're, if you're building them, a container might be nice, uh, or otherwise get a test machine um, while you're experimenting. And then the easiest way to invoke um, the kpatch build tool is, is for you to be running the, the kernel that you're um, intended on targeting. Um, so just make uh, my slides a little smaller. Uh, the tool can target other kernels. Um, you can target um, a source RPM, target a, an existing tree, all these options. Um, and you can look into the usage to figure out um, how to do that. I want to keep it simple for this demonstration. Um, so I will be assuming that you're running a kernel that, that you want to target. And, and load load a module on. Um, Joe, sorry, uh, we have several questions piling up. So is it okay to handle those now? Um, sure. Uh, yeah, if you if this That's, is not a good time, we can wait too. I'm, um, I'm okay with that. No, this is a good time because uh, the the next three slides will, will kind of go over a sample invocation. Okay. Okay, so the 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 question uh, in uh, in the chat is: Is the kernel live patch only for kernel updates, but not for other patches? I this yeah. kernel live patch only for kernel updates. So when you um, when you say other patches, what does that imply? User space patches. Um, um, so. It, if that's the case, well, live patching can only live patch um, the kernel at the moment. Um, I think there are projects. Marcos can tell you, I think SUSE has um, user space patching for maybe select um, libraries. Um, I think Case Place does as well. Um, very different sort of domains and, 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 and problems to solve. So for today, I think with, with uh, the source-based tools and, and K patch build tools it's going to be kernel only. So the follow up question is security patches. I mean, and I'm thinking kernel patch. Are you thinking kernel security patches? But go ahead. Yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's a follow up question. Right. So I think, uh, and as far as the the offerings that certainly SUSE and um, and Red Hat target, yeah, we're generally providing um, security patches of a certain um, severity. Um, simply because there are there are many things in the kernel that, that are out there to fix. And I think the ideal is we're not trying to indefinitely forestall a kernel update, but um, from a compliance point of view, might have security audits who want to see that so many of these CVEs uh, have been patched. So um, live patching is a convenient vehicle for that. Um, that's not to say that you can't use live patching for other purposes. Um, some other folks use it to um, roll out, I think, certain kernel features um, or maybe for testing purposes. So. Would that be same, Marcos, from uh, Sousa point of view as well? Or would you do something different? No, yeah, yeah. Uh, we usually create, not usually, but the main point of live patching uh, 
services to protect the, the customer from vulnerabilities. But as developers, I've seen people to create like patches to increase race, uh, race conditions just to test out vulnerabilities or create new functionality. But for testing purposes, I've never seen that in production already. Uh, but as Joe said, yeah, that's mainly for protecting the kernel from, from threats. And and also for us, we don't create for every uh, uh, for every vu vulnerability. Just with a CVSS, with score seven or higher, and but we analyze case by case and and for and for vulnerabilities that are only triggered by a super user, there's no point of creating a patch because the super user is already have powers to do anything. But that really depends. Yeah. But mainly, but majority of vulnerabilities, yeah. I've never seen other usages of the okay. technology in the field. Great, thank you. So another question is, I didn't see, I think it's probably for Marcos, uh, this question. I didn't see ARM um, in the list of supported hardware, which is a major issue. Is it planned to have ARM support in a closed future? I prefer both of you probably, but that's the question. Uh, yeah, about ARM. Um, so uh, currently, we we offer live patches uh, for all uh, upstream kernel availability of the live patching subsystem. So currently, it is for x86, 64, uh, PPC, and S390. So this is the official uh, support for the upstream kernel. So ARM is still in the works for quite some time, right, Joe? Uh, and also, Risk Five is in the works, if I'm not mistaken. Great. And uh, there is another, okay, I'm switching to Q&A now. There are about three questions in the Q&A. We completed the chat part. Uh, in the Q&A, I have, is there any minimum amount of memory required to create this and use it on the system? I think memory requirements for live patching. I'm guessing that's the question. Um, so I guess I'll start with the live patching. I, I mean, it's a kernel module, so I think you simply need um, enough memory to load that. Um, there's not a whole lot of overhead, I think, subsystem-wise. It's a little bit of tracking of sort of the um, the patch states and whatnot. Um, is the question more about these tools for building them? That might be more interesting and harder to answer question. All right. So I will wait, Sumit, to come uh, back on that. In the yeah. meantime, uh, Sumit, please respond to that. Uh, if the question, memory question is about the kernel part or generally for the tools. And there is the question from Dennis. How do you handle alt instructions, static, call, static calls, jump labels with KLP? As far as I can see, there is no check that the kernel code was not modified runtime. Um, so yeah, I can say that for a uh, source-based approach. So whenever we extract code that deals with static keys, we usually uh, have that KLP relock symbol. We just uh, uh, um, we just keep the same static branch, uh, likely static branch enabled and stuff by referencing the currently the the symbol that is currently running, right? But because we have source code and then we just compile that and we know that that symbol is it's public or needs to be uh, externalized, that's how we do in the source code, uh, in the source-based approach regarding tooling. Okay, great. Um, one more question from Ricardo. Is there performance hit for having these organized elves? Um, oh, first, organized else was, was just was my <laughs> yes, phrase to, I, to, I think so too. <laughs> but... to, to explain it, I, I can maybe I'll coin that one. I'll talk to Josh about it. Uh, um, so, right, is there um, performance hit um, from the compilation perspective? Um, I do think there is. Like, I think um, I mean, at some point, I've, I, I've seen people use the same argument function arguments for GCC for doing link time optimization and, and other purposes. And I, and I think 
it depends maybe on the the architecture as well if you have these huge kernels that have like just thousands of sections in the l file so um whatever tools are using to manipulate the object files um need to know how to handle that i think they're sort of like extended sections or, or something like that um that said at the end of the day as far as our use from kpatch perspective we're we're using that uh, option simply to determine um, the differences. The um, live patch that is generated out the other side um, this doesn't necessarily have uh, the same compiler options applied. We don't we don't need everything neatly organized. We can just let the let the linker figure out what it wants to do with you know the 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 extracted um, sections on the other side. Hey, great. Um, Sumit came back with clarification that it is um, uh, it is about memory information necessary for tools and other dependencies on the target system. So the memory question is related to tools and other dependencies. I'll start with the, the K-Patch tool that I'm presenting, and that would be, um, I don't know anything there's hard requirements, uh, essentially, and, and you'll see in a second, um, you need to be able to build um, two kernels and um, and then the tools will run some, some comparisons on that. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know off the top of my head, I think it depends on the size of the, the patch and exactly what uh, what's being changed. So um, that's how that, I haven't run into any sort of out of memory problems in a long time. Um, I would certainly entertain um, if you run into that issue, um, open open up issues on our, our GitHub uh, page and, and be kind of interested in seeing how real that is. And that's something that we need to put um, put in the like requirements section. Marcos, would, would, let, let's have you answer the question from your the, the tools that you're presenting as well. Uh, yeah, so KOP build, so the, the checks, they are fast. I mean, even for 50 or 60 kernels. And the Kling extract is also faster and it's not that resource hungry. KOP CCP, the, the current tool that we are using for production, it's much more resource hungry. Uh, but Kling extract is not. And as we don't generate binary from these steps, it steps it, it's very quick compared, I mean, to having to compile the kernel more than one time. And doesn't require that much memory. So I think it's it's not a problem if you don't have a strong machine to generate a live patch. So how do you Use... define a strong machine, I guess? That's the question. Oh, no, I, I mean, yeah, uh, it's not resource hungry. I mean, it's, yeah, I can say for sure. But currently, I I, I run four concurrent Kling extract instances. I uh, have four workers to to generate patches, but we are thinking about to increase to eight or more. Uh, so yeah, uh, I don't have any. I, I think I never saw any problems with Kling Extract. I have a not a strong laptop, uh, but just to mention that I never really had any issues with uh, Kling ex Extract. And I guess just like Joe's mentioned, uh, you know, if you find if some problems you can always come back and report them to um, yeah like yeah but job. but what i wanted to to emphasize is that we don't generate binary we just analyze mm. c code so i think that that's okay. be faster and not very resource hungry as the compiler right writing stuff okay yes makes sense one last question <laughs> before just uh, in the uh, Q&A, how do we test the changes when we don't have the required hardware for it, assuming we boot in a container? So for kpatch build, I think um, the container might be helpful um, to provide um, a tool set. Um, so with kpatch build, build because we're doing a binary comparison, you typically want to use the same GCC um, you know, tool set um, or yeah, it's just or Clang uh, tool set um, that you uh, use to build the kernel because you want it to make very similar decisions. Um, 
certainly, you know, because you're extracting this little binary blob. And so you want it to hook in, right? And kind of make all the same assumptions that the, the original compiler compiler did. So, um, and then you know, as far as loading it, um, you know, maybe a virtual machine would be better um, to, to use, uh, to crash that <laughs> and not, uh, and not, a, not your, your host system. Um, right. Oh yeah. Go ahead. Joe. That's okay. So, um, so we have, um, um, one more question that's already been answered that, um, after Sousa kernel. Okay. So after Sousa kernel live patching system requires the reboot or not, I think that's for Marcos. Uh, it's the same answer, right? Um, because the whole idea is that we are avoiding uh, reboots. Uh, live patch, let the system run, and then schedule reboots as needed or at its convenient time. I guess I'm answering for you, but <laughs> you can chime in, Marcos. <laughs> no, 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 that's exactly that. Yeah, we use live patches to at least to plan the reboots uh, ahead, right? And to avoid rebooting without any prior planning. Right. So one last, one last question in the Q&A, um, I mean chat, but I think this could be delayed potentially. We have seen many pros and what would be the cons? Maybe we can address this at the end of the, your presentation, Joe. If I don't want to, unless you already have an answer to that. Either no, one. I was going to say, yeah, let's watch the presentation and you, you'll get more cons. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> this Great. Thank you. Yeah. And that's all in the Q and A in chat. Good. Um, we have the next slide. It goes okay. So finally, uh, we get to uh, a sample build invocation. Um, so in this tool, uh, in this example, um, my helpful dog he's he's suggesting um, that if you invoke the tool with uh, a debug flag, um, what that will do is it will leave the intermediate build that it creates in place. So all the uh, object files that were built with that function sections, uh, compiler option uh, will be left on the system. And I find this is handy. if I wanna build uh, multiple patches or, or do it like iterate on one patch um, because it could, could, this is a certainly a con uh, of the, in, in the binary comparison tools that we, we do need to wait for kernel build to finish, the full kernel. So um, if you leave uh, this debugging mode on, you can sort of um, cache that that special build. And if you're iterating on a patch, um, and you would only need to rebuild what the, the object files that the patch changes. So this is a typical workflow that I'll do is, um, even if I'm working on a CVE patch, I might might set up my tools, my system, and then uh, I'll build this example patch uh, and just leave the object files in place. Um, so depending on how strong your machine is, that may take a few minutes, could also take very long, um, however long you know an ordinary kernel build takes. Um, so the patch, um, the example patch, this is in the, um, the, the kpatch GitHub repo. Um, it looks pretty familiar, exactly, I think, what um, Marcos built with the other tool. Um, all it does is just add a little string to uh, slash proc slash command line. Um, so now this output, um, so curated, the so output from the tool um, is very verbose if, you, if you're running... Um, either skip cleanup or or dash dash verbose um and so it's just it's just telling us that it's detected that i was running on a, um, a rel distro of a particular kernel and um it just fetched the source rpm automatically for me um through dnf um tested the patch i just wanted to make sure that it actually applies to the kernel that that i i want it to build for um and then it goes off reads some some information about the kernel, um, certain structure sizes that it may need to uh, recreate on the other side. Um, and it builds an original source tree and the patched source tree, which we saw in the one, two, three steps. Um, and then I think the most interesting uh, 
parts here I highlighted in the red boxes, um, the tool has um, determined that from command line.o, there was a changed function, command line proc show, um, and that uh, that object file belongs to VM Linux. Um, alternately, if we are patching a kernel module, it might report something like um, you know, md.ko or whatever. And then in the last steps, it builds um, a live patch um, kernel object and reports success. Um, I always like to see that. Sorry. Um, so quick uh, sort of behind the scenes with that debug flag, or if you use the skip cleanup flag, um, I try to summarize the, the temporary uh, scratch base that that it leaves behind. It's very useful again for for doing multiple builds um, or even debugging the tool. Um, for example, sometimes I might run a patch, and if it um, if it turns out that it reports that many unexpected functions had changed, then I might be interested to see well, you know, what exactly is going on here. Um, I I thought there was only one little little change. Um, so this is saved into a, a, a .kpatch um, directory. Um, the build log is saved in there as well. If you need to go back and refer to that, the temporary directory underneath of that has uh, the extracted original and patched um, object files from those two builds. Um, and then a third directory where it's extracted the changes out of that object file um, into a new one. It looks like the tabs are a little bit off here. That it's for all subdirectories, um, and then the the last two directories. There's a directory called patch. This includes uh, a couple object files that it that it created, as well as the, the boilerplate live patch API, you know, the kernel module kind of template, um, and then the last entry here, the source directory. Um, so in our case, we built from a source RPM that it had downloaded. So it had exploded that source RPM into this directory and all those object files um, are left behind here. Um, as I kind of alluded to earlier, if um, if you invoke the tool, you, you could target an existing um, kernel tree that's already built, in which case you wouldn't see this here. It would be you know, wherever you pointed it to. So now, um, I guess even more behind the scenes, uh, what exactly might the tool be looking at here? Um, it's pretty hard to, to provide a, a full like, object file dump on a little slide, um, but essentially this command line.o file might have a couple sections. Um, and in this case, uh, here is um, the section which contains the command line proc show function it's relatively short, and you'll notice that in the original version, that code, um, I think there were two calls. There was a sequential put string and a sequential put character um, in, in two parts. And then we replaced that, I think, with uh, a printf, a single printf command. So next slide. So on the end. And then in the patch version, now you see the function is a little bit different. Uh, it's smaller, sequential printf. Um, and so when kpatch build uh, analyzes these two files, um, it's, it doesn't fit on the slide, but you might have object files that have many more sections of other functions. Um, it will notice that this, uh, the, the corresponding sections for this function have changed and decide, well, okay, I'm going to extract this and put that into an output um, object file for packaging into a live patch. Okay, now uh, the fun part. Um, so testing it, um, um, the tools generated a, an ordinary KO file, um, it's just an ordinary live patch. You could use insmod if you want, um, but there's a kpatch tool. It's a little more user-friendly. Um, I think most distros have some sort of wrapper that kind of uh, help you manage uh, live patching uh, uh, modules. So simply kpatch load, 
the uh, the KO file, it waits until uh, the live patch transition has finished. If you saw our first talk, um, we talked about how live patches are not applied immediately. Um, it kind of happens over a period of time. So in this case, it only took two seconds for all of the tasks running on this machine to, uh, to sort of be patched, right? And once that's complete, function returns, we can then verify that proc command line uh, was indeed modified with our change. And then the bottom of the slide is just undoing, undoing what we did, just unload the module, um, wait around for all the tasks to uh, be safe to transition to the previous state, and then we just verify that our patch is indeed gone. So now some warnings. Of course, um, the command line uh, patch example uh, is very straightforward. Um, why we put it in the distro is uh, as the example. Um, probably one of the first ones that I try building um, for any new kernel or architecture. But that said, um, just because you have a patch that can render uh, a successful kernel build, doesn't mean that it can uh, that K patch build can successfully convert it to a live patch. And um, for example, um, I have a change here where I modified um, an instance of a, a static um, proc ops um, um, structure, in which case I changed uh, one of its function pointers. Uh, this is pretty similar to changing maybe um, you know a, a piece of data of a, of a structure that just had plain integers or anything like that. Um, the problem that kpatch build has is that there's no simple way for you know expressing a data change in a live patch. Um, this data structure already exists and is in the kernel somewhere in memory. Um, the live patching mechanism provided by the kernel only allows you to sort of reroute function calls via ftrace. Um, it, out of the box, it doesn't um, sort of literally patch places in memory um, and certainly not data. So in this case, the tool yell, it yells at you, spits out an error. There's an unreconcilable difference that it that it notices in the original and the, the patched uh, object files. Um, in this case, the um, function pointers are sort of implemented by like a relocation. But the same concept would apply um, if you had, uh, like I said, just an ordinary, like a numerical um, integer um, value. So then going even further, um, just because you have uh, a live patch KO, that key patch build created for you, does not imply that it's um, a successfully safe live patch. Um, Thinking in the first talk, we went over um, the usage of something called shadow variables and try to summarize that problem. Um, if you have a patch that, for example, changes the layout of a structure, and then you even updated the code that deals with the structure to now deal with the updated version of the uh, of that definition, you still might have to worry about all of these pre-existing instances that the kernel has created before you loaded your live patch. Um, so you need to think about how your live patch would handle maybe the original definition of a structure and the new definition of a structure. And then furthermore, um, you kind of have the same problem if you need to unload your live patch for whatever reason. Maybe you've created a whole bunch of new versions the new uh, with the new data layout. Um, you don't want to just uh, blindly hand those back to to the original kernel code if you were unloading the live patch. Um, so this is an example where um, the tool built what you asked for, uh, but what you've created is not safe, just like any other program. And the final warning. Um, so because kpatch build is doing binary comparison, um, something to be mindful um, is mindful of is how many object files might might be affected by your source code change. 
And I think this is probably a worst case scenario example here. Um, if you modify kernel.h, chances are you're going to rebuild the entire kernel tree. Uh, kpatch build is going to notice that more than a few object files have changed. You're now going to test every single object file that the kernel uh, has created. And um, I can tell you it's probably not going to work. <laughs> so um, we have limited time and limited kernel configurations that we've uh, tested with the tool. Um, there are certain uh, changes that are outright not supported. Um, we don't support changes to assembly code. Um, but uh, there very, very well may be some changes that uh, kpatch build isn't prepared to um, to be able to process. And you'll probably find bugs. So this is a really great test case. Um, but it, it sort of highlights the fact that what you're, you're working with here is binary changes, uh, object code changes. So be mindful. Um, modifying a header file in a small subsystem that's only included by like a handful of C files might not be a big deal, might be worth it. Make, the, you know, keep the patch looking like upstream. Um, but uh, for things like module.h or kernel.h, um, you probably want to localize these sort of changes to the very specific source files that really do need these new values and new changes. So now, um, given how long it's taken already to get this far, I don't know, we knew there's no way that we could handle uh, every single potential corner case, um, which there are a few. Um, so we have a patch author guide uh, on GitHub that, that tries to go into greater detail um, about, about some of these, these interesting gotchas and um, suggestions. Um, in, in gory detail with, with some examples. So uh, all the little links there there were, were sort of links to places inside the, uh, the author guide. So in general, um, so the best practices, I think, are really for, for both tools, whether you're using the source-based um, tool set that Marcos presented um, or even the binary comparison tools like kpatch build. Um, I think there's some common sense uh, sort of advice here. Um, minimizing the live patch set that you're trying to turn, you know, trying to load on the system. Um, we're very uh, active, right, in the, the world of security fixes. Um, and if you look at CVE fixes upstream, you know, upstream doesn't necessarily just tag, you know, they don't say, this one little fix or this one commit fixes, you know, CVE one, two, three, there might be a, a greater patch set that has been merged, in which case um, you might want to just sort of cherry pick out um, the parts that address your problem. Um, you know, the larger, the larger the patch that you, you bring in and try to build into uh, a live patch, uh, the greater sort of disturbance that you might make uh, as far as loading, loading this into a running system, you might need to do more work. You might need to run around simply to support what is kind of a more of a code cleanup kind of uh, commit. So um, that's suggestion one, sort of focus on the problem at hand. Um, second suggestion is a little bit higher level. Um, if you are thinking of having multiple fixes, um, there's a couple ways you can do that. And I think the suggested way that that I know Sousa and, and Red Hat um, have been using is to sort of um, accumulate a, a large patch, right? Um, so one patch might address three CVE issues um, and then um, use the, uh, there's an atomic replace feature, um, which will basically flush out uh, whatever pre-existing live patches loaded and make it so that the last live patch that you've loaded is the only one that takes effect. The alternative is try to load multiple KO files, which case you need to somehow figure out how to keep them all working together and not overlapping with each other. Um, it seems like a recipe for a lot of complexity that you can avoid. 
Uh, third point, not every upstream patch reasonable convert to a live patch. Um, certainly, um, like a lot of the uh, speculative execution um, CVEs from a few years ago, um, they require uh, not only compiler changes, but in some cases, um, microcode changes. Um, sort of no when to say no. Uh, I think the the goal behind most live patching uh, programs is to try to um, more conveniently um, schedule reboots. So you can't put them off forever. You can't upgrade from one kernel to the next uh, using live patch. Um, keep it realistic. Um, a final note, um, certainly read the documentation. Um, there was the, the kpatch build um, author guide, even though that's sort of targeting the, the uh, binary Differencing um, approach. There's probably a lot that's still applicable to source-based patching there. And then there's also upstream live patching um, documentation. So there's um, great documentation on shadow variables, callbacks, and, and things like that. Um, of course, ask questions. I think both, both GitHub projects would certainly entertain any um, Q&A or um, enhancements and bug reports. So with that, I think we reached the end of our pre-planned presentation. We have some questions. Sure, sure we have more questions. Yes. Um, so I hope, uh, I think it's Benjo um, asking, we have seen many pros, what would be the cons? I think Joe covered all of the cons. So if you have specific questions on those, please do ask. Um, and then the Q&A, there is a question from Ankur Trivedi uh, about security patches. But after security patches updates, it is asking, I'm assuming the system is asking for a reboot. We can reschedule it, but it, it, is it possible? Can we avoid the reboot? Uh, so I think that depends on what tool is asking for a reboot. Mm -hmm. um, and then whether that tool is knowledgeable about maybe the CVEs that are that are fixed by a live patch. Um, I think I that's guess. a very distribution specific question probably. Yes, Ankur, uh, if you can give specific specifics on uh, what it is, that'll be great. Um, and then the second question, um, there is, uh, let me go see that question because I asked a follow-up question for that. Um, so did does the li live patch stick compliance? I think that is security technical implementation guide. That's the question, but I mean, isn't it a larger question of is kernel stick compliant? But I mean, live patching is, but anyway, I'll let you answer that, Joe or Marcos, either one. I wasn't sure what the state compliance means. Um, the stig compliance. It is oh, stig. uh the stig is um security. Um let me see what stig is. I yeah. Okay, let me see. Sig is tech security technical implementation guide. I haven't heard about this before, so I can't uh, really answer. <laughs> I have to say, no, I haven't heard it. Uh, Marco. So, no, no, me too. Never heard, heard about that. that. I guess it would be no. Sorry. Or we don't know. Uh, so, okay. So uh, move on to, I'm going to move on to the next question. Uh, is it possible to write live patch on top of li live patch? Is it a scenario like apply a live patch, revert the live patch, apply a new live patch with merged changes? Ah, uh, uh, yeah. So, so that was, um, I think, one of the bullet points in the last slide um, is yeah, how do you manage that problem? Um, and yeah, it, it, uh, the life, the kernel's live patching uh, API supports using it many ways. One way you could do it is creating separate KO files and loading them at the same time to address different. Uh, subsystems or different CVEs. Um, the problem kind of comes into play is if you need to uh, 
modify the same functions across two different <laughs> modules. And like I said, I think that kind of that gets a bit complicated. Um, not not a not a solution that I've really spent a lot of time I think pursuing. So um, the way that I we were suggesting arranging it is that right you you basically accumulate more and more fixes into a single uh, live patch. And what will happen if you build it, uh, there's an option called Atomic Replace. Um, that is the default k-patch build. Um, I'll let Marcos answer for the other uh, other tool set. But essentially what will happen is um, as you, if you load version two, uh, say of a live patch, um, it will completely unload version one um, while loading version two. So it kind of happens in an atomic fashion. So you're here, you don't have this uh, this sort of gap. Um, and then uh, all your your sort of reference module references to the first live patch would um, ideally go to zero and, and allow you to unload it. Um, so I think that that's the way most most vendors approach that problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so talking about our approach, even though we we generate specific uh, files for specific symbols, even though in the end we just bring everything together as one big uh, live patch, and whenever we have a new live patch that's released, I mean, some weeks after that one, it contains new uh, fixes plus the older ones. So that's how we, we maintain this ability to, to track which things were fixed and not undo things that were fixed before. Uh, this is how we control. That's usually the, I think that's the best practice that we also use be, because if you start creating, um, I mean, separate stack live patches, I mean, stack it because you have multiple of, of, of them, it's hard to track if you are running, if you are applying a new live patch with all previous applied fixes on the same function that you did before. So this can get complicated very easy. So we would suggest you to, to use this cumulative approach with Atomic Replace. Okay, great. Um, and then um, I think Joe might have touched on this before, but uh, do you provide a single live patch for all CVEs or a separate live patch for every CVE fixed? I think, Joe, you were talking about how uh, it might be beneficial to combine changes, but I don't know if this is a different answer for this. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of thinking about it. Um, so I guess when I when I was talking about grouping them into a, a mm -hmm. single patch, I, I meant a single live patch. Um, uh, KO file. So the, the K patch build tool, for example, um, it will um, you can you can specify more than one patch on the command line. So you say K patch build, you can say patch one, patch two, patch three, and it will apply those um, in order, um, and then do its two you know comparison builds. Um, so that's that's how we do it at Red Hat. Is that as we sort of um, address new CDEs for a particular kernel, we just sort of keep adding them to that command line invocation. So the resulting uh, one live patch KO uh, kernel module just gets, you know, get, gets fatter. Right. Um, okay, so there is a question. I would appreciate quick pros and cons of the source versus binary approach. Yeah, so for source-based, I would say that one of the, the pros that we, we think is that uh, we generate a C file and we can we can see exactly what the binary will, will look like because we usually, not usually, we use the same compiler version that was used to, to compile that same kernel that we are creating a live patch for. So that's one of the advantages that we, we see is that we see the C code that will be uh, compiled, right? 
Uh, another advantage is, is that it's it's fast to just extract uh, C files and then co compiling that small C files into live patches. And maybe cons that we have more manual interventions or manual checks and our tooling from time to time, we find a corner case uh, when parsing C code. Uh, so as we said, PCCP is, is an older tool and something will, and some things were created manually there. So whenever the kernel starts using new C features, that tool needs to be updated. Uh, so that's why we started with LLVM because we get that for free. But from time to time, we find new corner cases uh, as well. So that's something that it's not a con, but some things that we, we, we hit some issues from time to time. So let me ask you a question. I think the, the biggest advantage to source I can see, uh, see is that you can um, review them. You can generate that patch and have a, a review uh, by a few people. Uh, and then get that. So in your experience, Marcos, how often, if you have gone through the reviews, how often have you found problems in the a live patch after the live patching process in the source? Yeah, not many. Uh, so from time to time, we find some things because of multi-architect multi architecture support that we have. So sometimes the, the tools, they expand every macro. So if we, if you have some macros that uh, switch between little engine and big engine, uh, and we, if you are extracting code on, on x86, that will just uh, uh, become a, a cast, right? But on the other architecture that should be staying the same. Uh, we found that some time ago in one specific patch. That happens, but it's very rare. It's very rare. So wow. we, we trust the, the tools actually to extract the correct code, let's say. But yeah, as you said, it's much easier to review, right? The the out the outcome of the ex extraction. Right. And you That's have true. a level of confidence that that it has gone through reviews. Um yes. So I would think that for me from uh, personally, that would be a extra level of confidence for me. Okay, let's see. Um so there's uh so there was a question about oh, okay so the uh security patches uh about asking reboot um this is regarding suze live patching yes but um oh okay okay suze klp slash suma is asking the system to be rebooted is that correct i mean uh, ankur i think that's the question um, Marcos, if you can see, I think that there is a previous question that said, asked about, uh, let me see, uh, security patches update, after a security patch update, the system, it is asking a reboot. So we asked a follow-up question that, hey, what, what is that it? And that it seems to be Suze KLP Suma. Um, so Suma is the Suze manager project. It's made to to uh, manage uh, fleets of, of servers. And maybe that warning was when it says about security vulnerabilities applied or things like that, maybe it stalled the new kernel like you see in your distribution. So whenever a new kernel is installed, I think that in all major distributions, you can see a warning say, yeah, you must reboot, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that, I I'm mean, not that's sure. Okay. Uh, sorry, sorry, Sean. that's okay. I was thinking any update, uh, if you were to update your distro, it will say reboot now or later. So, that's if that is the case. Yeah, I think so. I'm not sure about Suma, never really played with that, but I know that Suma also applies live patches uh, whenever it see there is a new one. But I think that it shouldn't ask if ask you to reboot the machine specifically because of that. That may that maybe because it applied fixes for other libraries, maybe. Thank you. Yeah, I can say that for sure. <laughs> <It's just> that. <laughs> yes. Without yeah. without knowing all the details, it's hard to say. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's a question. What are the technical distinctions between standard live patching mechanism and patches implemented using eBPF?
Well, um, I think anything implemented in eBPF, I think, um, I mean, that's its own little sort of <laughs> world. Um, I don't, I don't know much about the assumptions about whether eBPF, um, they typically modify kernel memory or they're just observing it. Um, so I can't can't really speak to uh, how how an eBPF patch would work, um, but I mean from a live patching perspective, I think we may use similar sort of hooks. Um, live patching relies on f uh, f um, f trace right mm -hmm. to sort of reroute functions. Um, I'd imagine eBPF probably some, something similar to hook into the call. Uh, you know call path um, and executing a task. So I don't really have a great answer to that one. Um, just that the, the live patch um, implementation is just a kernel module. So however you can concoct, uh, you know, functions in a kernel module um, and then attach them to the API, you know, you're, you're free to do that. Um, maybe theoretically you could even have an eBPF payload in, in a live patch? I, I don't know. There are two different use cases, aren't there? I mean, live patch, the what you you would you would use live patch. Live patch is a complete solution for being able to do this. I to me, um, I don't know if you can compare them even. But yeah. So <laughs> thank you though. Thank you, Joe, for answering that question. Okay, let's see. There is are there any known issues with the live patching and secure boot? Has it been tested? Um, I think that whenever you apply a new live patch, it thinks the kernel, right? Either uh, mm -hmm. either yeah. way, because it's it's changing the the, the current kernel uh, running. It's you are adding more code that wasn't, I mean, <laughs> originally there. But I'm not sure because I think that um, yeah, I'm not really sure. If yeah, we have secure boot enabled, right? I think we well, and and RAL and, I mean, yeah. with the K patch uh, kernel objects. I mean, they're they're built in a contained sort of space and signed um, signed by like a Red Hat signing key. So um, the provenance we you, you know when you load it, one the RPM is signed as well as well as, as I think the kernel module. Um, so in that case, I think. I think it, I know it's tested and uh, it's supported and I think that's how it's implemented. Yeah, yeah, that's why I, I, I was thinking about it because yeah, it's it's of course enabled in our site too. And as you yeah. said, all, all, all modules that we ship are also signed. So there wouldn't be any problem about uh, and trusted, right? Because it, it is trusted because we distribute that. So I don't see any issues with that. Okay, so we have it. Thank you. We have a, a three-part question here. Um, the first one is, which improvements or new features are being worked on? Which new features should we expect in future? Yeah, so um, we can say that currently the the kernel of batch states, they are being re reworked to have a better support for shadow variables. It has been discussed for quite some time. Um, Peter from from Sousa is about to send a new a new version soon. That is one point. KOP convert is a tool that's still being discussed, uh, but yeah, <laughs> still being reviewed. And Joe, do you have any other suggestions about things that are being worked? I guess um, I would say that uh, you mentioned KLP convert, and I think that's an example of uh, trying to trying to upstream some common tool sets here. So KLP convert allows one to create the so-called uh, KLP relocations. Um, this is sort of the magic that allows uh, an external module to access uh, what's ordinarily um, private symbols in the kernel. Um, so I think that shadow variables was a good example of that um, and then KLP convert. So movement on that front, um, I think from an architecture's 
perspective, um, you mentioned um, Risk Five and ARM. Um, there's ongoing efforts uh, on those two architectures. Um, there's sort of a lot of requirements behind the scenes um, for the kernel itself to be prepared to support live patching. It kind of uh, the step one that needs to occur. Then we can start um, supporting it with these tool sets. Um, so yeah, architecture wise, I think um, yeah, I think that probably covers it for the current sort of uh, state of the subsystem. Great. Um, so the, uh, uh, the second part of the question is: Are live patches given to non-commercial free users? The patches which are created for SUSE kernels are those shipped for free for users as well. I'm not sure. I don't think so. It's, hmm. I think it's subscribed in the, the SUSE subscription. I think it's it's tied together with the repositories, if I'm not mistaken. So Yeah, I would think yeah. so. I I think any distribution, I mean any anybody, any anybody could use Live Patch. Live patch, you can use it on your own system if you want. Um, mm. And I don't think you would, you you might decide, okay, this is the patch I want to live patch. I don't want to reboot. I don't know. You could do that. So I don't know. And then also these patches would be dependent on the kernel version and a lot of different factors. So I don't think that they will be used to uh, providing these uh, uh, system-wide, just like distribution. I'm speaking, speaking from a perspective of generally upstream kernel and, and, uh, and that perspective. And the third part of this question is, um, is there a possibility that companies form a foundation and start creating live patches for upstream kernels and giving these patches? I don't think so. I mean, it is just, at least for me, it is just dependent on what your uh, use case is, um, how much tolerance do you have um, for keeping the live patch going? And it's just a very use, use case specific thing. And do you have the need to have the kernel running um, and do we have the need for ma scheduling maintenance? I don't know, Joe and Marcos, um, those are my thoughts on that. So if you want to. Uh, I think that's um, pretty much what I was going to say. Um, for, um, you know, as far as the binary, the, the live patch kernel object, like you said, that's going to depend on what kernel you're running. So that depends right on your configuration settings um, and then your patch level. Certainly, all the distribution kernels are generally what I call Franken kernels. Um, mm -hmm. They started out <laughs> looking like <laughs> upstream, um, and then they either yeah they go off on their own. Right. So sometimes you know we even see that uh, across older versions um, at Red Hat, the patch that we need for rel nine is different than rel eight, different mm -hmm. than rel seven, and even inside of those as well. So, um, like you said, very specific to the kernel. That said, um, the source RPMs, I you know, those are um, you know they provide the the patches um, for the live patch, um, and so anybody that has access to the I guess the source RPMs is free to look at the actual uh, patch that that we use to uh, to create those kernel objects, um, and then furthermore, I think um, Marcos could probably talk about this. SUSE has a, I think, an upstream uh, or a, a publicly accessible Git project where you guys keep your your live patches. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I think so. We yeah. have that on kernel source or or kernel repositories on GitHub, I think. So yeah. our live patch code are are there because it's C file, right? We can just compile that. Uh, but yeah, that's also a uh, code stream uh, um, tight, right? Because that that was made for specific updates uh, uh, of a product. Uh, we support every update for 13 months. So every car that is being released, right? We have support for that one year. So, and sometimes we have four, five, 10 versions of the same live patch for different kernel versions. And sometimes we just have one for code that doesn't change that much. Um, but yeah, the, the, the patches, they are uh, version dependent. Um, 
So sometimes not, but that's the minority of, of times. Um, but yeah. So we have uh, just about three minutes left and we have lots of questions here still. Um, Ankur, it looks like, has more questions about, um, say, rebooting, asking, uh, Suma rebo asking rebooting. Maybe um, you can reach out um, for those questions later. Let me see. that There is one update on STIG compliance, which is, I think, important to mention here. Uh, somebody came back and said stick compliance is more concerning for uh, it's a uh, for the defense industry and a government requirement, especially for U.S. market. Live patching comply do comply with stick. I guess it does. I don't know, but um, I don't think uh, we from the kernel perspective and then live patching perspective, Joe and Lar uh, Marcos. I don't think that we looked at it, but if it does comply, great. Uh, let me see. Gosh, so many questions. Is Candice, um, Joe, first of all, Marcos and Joe, do you have a little more time to answer these questions? And Candice, how are we doing on time? We can run a little bit over if you guys want to stay on and answer some more questions. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Okay. Then I'll go through. Um, but after security patches updates, it's asking for the reboot. We can reschedule it, but it is possible. Can we avoid the reboot? Distribution is SUSA, KLP, KPatch, SUMA. I think that's from Ankur asking about reboots still. I don't think yeah. there is enough yeah. context, Marcos, for you to answer, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I would just like to say that I never really uh, played with SUMA before. But as I said, that's maybe because it also applies uh, another update for different uh, packages. And by that, if you update glibc or Mesa or other chart libraries, it will ask you to reboot anyway. So th that's how I think that that could be the issue. So if if that's not the issue, so please open a, a bug on the Suma project because it's on GitHub. So yeah, they the so more people can answer that question. Okay. So will applying the live patch stop the kernel? Is the, is, I think that's the question. Um, no, no, uh, no. Yeah, Joe, please go. Yeah. I was going to suggest the first talk that we did was more right. kernel-centric <laughs> perspective. And we uh, kind of contrasted that how it started. It originally did stop. The machine it does not anymore it happens sort of in the background right yeah what well, do watch the first one that gives a lot more information on um, how to do this um okay live patching support i think this is a question has question and statement live patching will support does live patching support only c if yes then in future is there any possibility to extend it to rust I would yeah, say so, it depends on Rust yeah. support in the kernel too. I mean, you know, how how much support do we uh, the kernel uh, Rust support too? But go ahead, Joe and our Marcus. I would start with um, you know, is there um, F trace support for <laughs> Rust? Um, yeah. At least that's how Live Patch was traditionally implemented, right? It's on the function entry. Um, into uh right c function so um I, I mean if rust is the future i think uh, certainly at some point it needs to you know have serious consideration um how feasible it is i i don't know at the moment so what you're saying is there are dependencies that need to be met before you can consider doing that yeah there's there's a lot more work that needs to right, be done yeah, kernel dependencies and then kernel the, dependencies yeah. yes and Rust, and Rust, uh, we're still uh, Rust has needs hooks, and they have been adding hooks to various things. But yeah, until all of those things are in place, okay. So does live patching can um, work work with LTO enabled kernels? Uh, CFI requires it. Profile guided optimization support. I don't know. I don't know. I guess you probably would know. Um. It's probably important to separate yeah, live live patching maybe from the tool <laughs> itself. Um, as far as the live patching perspective, I 
don't see any reason why it doesn't. Uh, and then furthermore, um, there's an engineer at Facebook. Um, he's been working on or had worked on um, enabling kpatch build for LTO kernels. Um, this gets into a very interesting problem for live patch. Um, I think in general, because once you start optimizing across uh, object files, you know, you might have um, pieces of code that are, yeah, it's vast. You know, the idea is to try to right, shrink, um, I guess, the, the footprint of the kernel. So if all these places around the kernel potentially reusing little parts of code, so you get into the issue of, well, if you want to replace that little bit of code, is that really what you want to do? Or do you want it affecting all the potential people who are calling it? Um, so from binary comparison point of view, um, I don't think Kate patch build is there yet um, working on it. Um, so uh, what do you think, uh, Marcos? Yeah, for us, it's the same. Actually, because we just look up for um, for source code. So the link time up optimization happens after all the objects were generated, right? And it tries to eliminate code. And I think that we, we had an issue with Clang Extract recently uh, with the the author uh, opening a bug about open SSL. It was creating a user space like patch and it was enabled, yeah, it was compiled with, L, with LTO. So we were referencing a function that is not in the end binary because it was removed by L, by LTO, right? So for now, I think that it needs some adjustments in our, in our side as well. So okay, it seems, so, it's, it's, oh. it's, it's, it's assuming it works for everyone, I think. <laughs> okay, looks like um, there is one more question about um, more res where where can we find more resources? on understanding kernel live patching, live patching API. I think you have mentioned all of the resources in the in this presentation. Perhaps. Yeah, for, for kernel API, uh, for the live patch API, we, we discussed that a lot in the previous session, but it's in docs.kernel.org. If, if you can search for live patch, you will land there. Uh, but also in the previous presentation, mm -hmm. we, we go through the API, the structs that needs to, uh, in the source-based one I have here, at least the boilerplate code, right, to, to hook up. So this part's about KOP func, KOP object, uh, KOP patch, and how we enable live patch, right? Uh, so you can just look at the samples live patch in the kernel source, in the upstream kernel, and also uh, watch the previous session that we discussed mm -hmm. that in more details. Okay. Yeah, do watch the previous session. And there is documentation live patch uh, under the kernel tree as well. You can take a look at that. And it'll all, uh, it probably, um, even the next question will be answered in the previous uh, um, webinar. Does the live patch can be apply on multiple servers at the same time for different CVE? I don't know. Sorry, multiple. Ones. So the same patch, or um, uh, you want to apply the same patch to multiple servers? Not quite sure. Yeah, it it yeah. So in some cases, if the code doesn't change, right, that specific part of the code doesn't change, you can you can of of course use the same generated source or or the same gen generated uh, binary for k patch right joe it's the same approach i think right so i mean the kernel module targets a specific um kernel so as long as the server runs that kernel that's fine um mm -hmm. but the right the, the the source to your patch might need to change depending on what kernel that you're targeting Right. Yeah. So for us, it's 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 common uh, sometimes to use the same patch for all supported uh, kernels that we we have, but that's very specific to very specific functions, right? That don't change that much. But in our case, we compile that for every kernel, so it's it's still uh, versioned, right? 
Uh, but yeah, if if the code is the same, um, you can use the same. Like because manage. it depends what it is, right? It could be a you, you might be looking at a um, ARM server and a uh, just talking about x86 server and AMD versus Intel, and the depending on what you're patching, it might not be applicable. So it, you really have to look at that more closely, I would think, um, to look at that. Okay, so looks like um, did we answer the last question? Let me see. I think this is the last question we have. This is asking about rollback of live patching. Did Marcos do we uh, Joe? Did we cover? Did you cover that in the last one? Rolling back in the last webinar. They're asking for a procedure to roll back the live uh, Suze live patching kernel. That's the same. Uh, that's the same, right, Joe? Uh, that's we we use the upstream subsystem, the upstream live patch subsystem, so you can roll back of patches, yeah. Technique, so I think I think SUSE supports rollback uh, for Red Hat. I think we we had wanted to uh, basically replace it. So instead of unloading a patch, we kind of want to always move forward. So we would use that atomic replace feature in the new version to uh, try to, um, like if we had an incomplete CVE fix, um, that said, if, if the situation arose where we didn't need to unload a live patch, um, like Marco said, right, the API does provide that ability. Um, but yeah, I think that we never did that in the field. It was never necessary, as you said, as well. But yeah, the kernel supports that, right? Right. And I think in the first talk, maybe we, we kind of allude to some problems there, right? Is like if you have modified um, the system state by your live patch, then that's, and you want to unload the live patch, it needs to be safe for the previous state to deal with whatever you've, whatever changes that you've made. So um, that's another reason why, uh, at least at Red Hat, I prefer to kind of just keep moving forward with with new versions of the live patch to keep the testing matrix a little bit sane, you know, otherwise you could just, you know, unload at any point and increase the number of permutations <laughs> on the machine that you need to test. Hmm. Okay. That makes sense. I think our chat as well as Q and A don't have any questions for a change. That's one more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, as soon as I spoke, there is one. I think this is probably the last question we will take. Can we use upstream patch set and live patch the same time or different? I am not sure about the question. Um, so, I mean, the patch set comes in from stable and then combining that with live patch? Or... So the... The upstream patch, assuming to say this uh, addresses um, a kernel CVE, um, that would give you a new kernel image, um, and then you've converted it into maybe a live patch. So I think the general uh, general use case might be that you would use the live patch while you're running the older vulnerable kernels, um, so at least you're secure. Then you would install the updated kernel alongside of vulnerable one, um, you now have, uh, with the live patch, you can schedule the reboot at a more convenient time. And then once you reboot it to the upstream patch or the patch kernel, um, and then you no longer need a live patch for it. I think maybe yeah. that's how uh, the question was asked. I, I think I think that sounds right, because you don't want to mix them. Um... I would think that, yeah. Well, it, anyway. it's sort of by definition, I don't think you could yeah. patch. I mean, I technically you could, I guess. So um, like with kpatch, if say you had the patched uh, a function, you just add a no op. You could literally, you know, provide the same function that the kernel originally had. Mm -hmm. So if you have a patched kernel and it's running, your problem is solved. Right. Um, I would differentiate between can you versus would you? 
um, I would think that because if you did that, you have to retest a lot of these things. I mean, you don't know what you're mixing. So I would, is a can you versus would you? <laughs> Does that make sense? So that's probably the, the, the something that as if I may, if I'm looking at that scenario, that's probably what I would look at. Okay, good. Great. Thank you. All right. So um, I thank you for staying in for 12 more, 12 minutes to answer questions. This has been a long session. Thank you so much. Candice, back to you. Thank you so much, Marcos, Joe, and Shua for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today, and a copy of the presentation slides will be added to the Linux Foundation website. We hope you are able to join us for future mentorship sessions. Have a wonderful day.